Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Good morning and welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and your professional goals. I am your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my amazing guests, we bring you inspiring and actionable insights to take your life and your business to the next level. Ranked in the top 2% globally, this podcast really is a must listen, and it's because of my guests. So whether you are tuning in for entrepreneurial tips, career advice, or personal development strategies, get ready to turn inspiration into action challenges into triumphs and dreams into reality. And today we're discussing a pretty important topic. We're discussing the sixth edition of a best-selling classic written by women for women. Authors Alexander Armstrong and Mary R. Donahue join me today to talk about their book, which provides essential tools and insights for widows, and not necessarily widows, by the way, who are navigate, navigating emotional and financial challenges. And this compassionate guide offers a roadmap from grief to well-being, addresses the interconnected emotional and financial aspects of widowhood and pretty much everything in between. The authors who are widows themselves share relatable stories and practical tools, allowing readers to explore at their own pace. And as I mentioned just very briefly, while focused on widows, the book's insights have proven invaluable for many, many women emphasizing emphasizing financial literacy and emotional resilience. So good morning, Alexandra and Mary. It's good to have you here. And thank you for sending your book to me. It's on my desk as we speak. So ladies, can you introduce yourselves to our audience? Well, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Mary Donahue, and I am a psychologist. And I my story goes as follows. Um, I was widowed suddenly when my daughters were 10 and 15. And at that point in time, my husband and I had recently agreed that we were going to work with a financial planner and we had selected Alex. In translation, that meant basically that my husband did the work with Alex and despite his trying to get me involved on many, many occasions, I did not. And so when he suddenly died, I was left with Alex and Alex was left with me. And I was not an easy person to work with, um, which she reminded me of in a very good way and someone that I needed. And from that point on, our relationship went forward. And ultimately, we became friends. And when Alex approached me about her interest in writing a book for widows, something that they could take with them after talking to her, I was very interested and said that I would really love to join her with that project because I would like to prevent other widows from being in my situation. So Alex, I think you should pick it up from here. Hi, I'm Alex Armstrong, and I'm a certified financial planner, and I've worked with many widows over the years, but my my experience goes back further than that, because my mother was widowed when she was 48, and I was eight, and we were left with no money, and I saw that her lack of financial knowledge really was a detriment to our moving forward, and when I got um, got into the financial world, I vowed that I would help other women uh, take control of their lives. When Mary is talking about this, uh, Mary is a very intelligent woman, but she was she kept thinking what her father would do, what her husband would have done. And finally, I said to Mary, come on, you make decisions every day of your life. You've got to make a decision now. And Mary sort of shook her head and she said, oh, I guess you're right. And from then on, we move forward. But so when I decided to write the book, as Mary alluded to, I said, uh, dealing with widowhood is not just a financial episode. It is financial and emotional. 
And the underlying theme of our book really is, you know, if you get your financial house in order, then you can only you can deal only with the grief and it's so much easier. But if you have to deal with both at the same time, it really you almost get into a panic situation. So we by writing this book, we thought if you take a chapter at a time and just take at your own pace, then what I was telling them when I was visiting with the widows in my office was going in one ear and out the other. This way, they had something they could refer to. But I thought it was really important to do the emotional as well as the financial. And that's what makes our book unique. It's different than others because it's usually from one aspect or the other or one widow story. But in our case, we thought they're so intertwined that we have to deal with both of them. So there is no book in the market, by the way, that, uh, at least to our knowledge, which has looked at the way in which emotional and financial healing are linked. Uh, in other words, the better able you are to come to terms with your loss, the better able you will be to able to understand your financial situation and vice versa. Well, yeah, we're talking a term that I call grief brain. And it's been my experience and the experience of my friends who have been widowed that you should not be making big decisions while you're in grief brain and financial decisions. I think are some of those you need help. You really need help. And I'll give you a quick story. I'm in Southwest Louisiana. I'm smack in the middle of Cajun country. And I had sold my house, moved to a, a rent house temporarily while we were hunting for this particular house which I bought right between Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, by the way. And I get a phone call from my, my landlady, who I've never spoken with her. I always dealt with her husband, quite elderly people. But she was in a genuine panic. Her husband had just died. She couldn't reach her son-in-law, who typically took care of their rental properties. And he was kind of a property manage, manager for them. She didn't know how to write a check. There was somebody at her door, needed a bill paid, and she didn't know how to write a check. Listen, I and I wasn't even dressed. It was early in the morning, and I got dressed. I hoofed it across those two houses, and all I could do was grab her and hug her. Poor thing. Bless his heart. He did what he thought was the right thing. And again, they're quite elderly, and I'm sure she's gone now. But he took care of everything. She was completely and totally lost. And I have never forgotten that. It's like, you know, you know, you think you're doing the right thing, but you're not. These are these are problems. These are issues. As married couples, you need to share them. Well, I couldn't agree with that more because certainly I'm a prime example of that. And it was no fault of my husband. It wasn't as though he said, now, never mind, honey, I'll take care of this. Um, he did try to get me involved, which put me in a much more difficult situation because it was a sudden death. And um, I do want to say that, you know, on the emotional side, on the grief side, um, the manner in which you lose your spouse also in, it can impact the way you heal. Because if you lose someone on a sudden death level, as opposed to a terminal illness, there are differences. But there are is also a great deal of universality. So you have to recognize those things too, I think, when you're working with people. But certainly, the more knowledge you have, you're definitely the, the better able you are to cope with where you find yourself. And you bring up an interesting uh, situation. I had a similar situation with one of my clients who inherited about $6 million. It was several years ago. And um, she had never written a check. And she said to me, I, can I keep my housekeeper? I said, yes, of course you can keep your housekeeper. And so I said, let's sit down and let's go over all this together. You brought up the issue of the son taking care of everything, which is wonderful. If the son is the right son, sometimes the son steps in and is a... Um, maybe not the best person to step in. So you that that's another reason if you understand your situation before, then you can assert yourself. In this book, we weave the story of four widows 
And one of them is in that situation, that she was uh, a wife who wasn't involved. And her son, in a good meaning manner, tried to take over. But, but she really needed to do it for herself. So those are one of the messages we say that it's great to have help, but you need to, to take responsibility yourself too. In terms of the book Alex just mentioned, the way we've written this book, we've, we've written it so that it can be read cover to cover or a given chapter if you're looking for some particular uh, issue to address. Also, we selected four decades in which to place our widows. So we have a widow in 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And we put into their stories what is likely to be the case for a woman in that decade when she is experiencing the loss of her husband. So it's an easy read. And I think Alex has told me more than one time that some of her finance people have shared with her that they really wanted to read the stories just to see how it ended up. Um, so it's an easy read and it's easy to comprehend information. Um, and I don't think we can stress that and that enough. And we deal, we deal not just with the um, event, we pick it up after the spouse has died and take it from there. But when we tell the stories of the widows, we really focus on the first year and then a little later, but then we finish with where they are 10 years later. So the whole message is you, although you're in a crazy situation when your spouse dies, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is a future. If you just take it a day at a time, bit by bit, you can get there. And so that that is our underlying message that we tell through the widow's stories. Right, and one of the things that Alex usually points out, but I'm gonna say it now, um, is that the fact that you had not done much in the way of dealing with your family's finances does not preclude your ability to doing so, to one, taking it on once you understand what's involved and you acquire some knowledge. And I think that's an important thing for widows as well as all women. The fact that you haven't done something in your life doesn't say you cannot do it um, and you just have to go forward. We knowledge. say it's, it's don't confuse a lack of knowledge with a lack of ability to learn. And I am actually, while you're talking, I'm thumbing through the book, which thank you. This this chapter, and I've got sticky notes all over it, but this chapter is called Dealing with Your Emotional Needs, which let's face it, those are going to come first for most people. And you talk about the need for family and friends. There's a list of things, a physician, spiritual advisors, widow support groups. That's important. And the internet, is that a friend or a foe or both? I mean, the internet, look, I live on the internet. It's where it's where I do business, but well, you have to use some critical thinking there. You need mental health professionals. You need psychiatrists, perhaps, psychologists, perhaps, social workers, professional counselors. There's an entire list of things that you're going to be dealing with or looking for or seeking help from. So where are you finding that people start I mean I obviously they're emotional clearly they're going to be emotional and probably halfway nuts so well I think where it do depends. they start I'm just okay to start I think it depends on the woman and where, how she's lived her life you know and just as you've said we provide um, contacts or I would say people in different professions that are available to help a widow dependent on the widow because some widows are going to want to find someone to work with if they feel that they're totally lost and others are going to turn to the internet. Um, I have a close a psychologist friend actually that upon the loss of her husband did turn to the internet to get herself into a grief group because that was the best thing for her. But that's a woman by woman thing. Um, and there's not one size fits here at all, whether it's grieving or finances, um, it goes individual by individual. But what you need to know is what's out there for you. Should you have the need, then you would know how to reach out and where to look for competent people. 
And so to look at that from two points of view, you know, it used to be in the old days, you know, it was it was difficult to go to a psychologist that was admitting something's wrong. But this is a crazy situation and you don't have to go into long term therapy. You can go to someone who can help and be an objective advisor to you. And we try to demystify and say that that, that was okay. But on the other hand, the internet, we've just read so much. Uh, thank goodness there's so much publicity about it, about the fraud, about how widows are lonely and they turn to the internet and then they get lose their life savings. Hopefully there's enough out there to warn you about that, but that that is one of the issues that we discuss. And the other thing we talk about is the internet for the person who, after they've settled down, say a year after they've been widowed, they're looking for companionship, how they might work with the internet. Personally, Mary and I are not really interested in, in using that, but we realize some people are. And so we give them some guidelines of things to look out for and to do if they are interested in pursuing a relationship uh, via the internet. Where the, our, our real message is go slow, uh, but, uh, but we thought it should be dealt with in the book, which is, this is the sixth edition of this book and it's that type of thing that we introduced that wasn't in the last book, just as with the stages of grief. There's, uh, as Mary alluded to, it makes a difference if you have a sudden loss or if you have a, uh, you've been dealing with it for a long time. It's still a loss, but in one case, the shock is a real issue of how you deal with it. Whereas the lingering, you know, or you assume is eventually going to happen, which happened in my case. And so you are somewhat better prepared for the event. I think also we we need to stress that, as you know, where we are now, there is the need for human contact, um, particularly at a time like this. But not all widows are going to be open to it. They're going to go to the Internet or try to find something out there that they can do on Zoom as opposed to dealing with an individual. So, again, you have to know. And we do discuss the personalities of the women in terms of how they deal with the loss. So if you are more introverted, you're likely to go in one direction than if you are more extroverted. And again, it depends on where you are in the lifespan. Uh, so the 70-year-old is undoubtedly not going to be looking for the same things as the 40-year-old. But as far as uh, what she might need to do financially, some of that is the same. And I, I have another question. So, and, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, but I think it's an important thing to talk about. How does emotional recovery intertwine with financial recovery for widows? Because you can't just do one or the other. You have to do both. That is correct. Um, and it, it, it's it's critical. Um, and you have to allow yourself um, to mourn and to grieve the loss of your loved one, uh, which very often paralyzes you in terms of understanding where you are financially. But it also, if you're in that state, leads to insecurity. So having an understanding of where you are financially, it's like the woman that Alex was just talking about who had all this money but didn't have a clue and thought, well, she might be destitute. So we do find, and that's really why we wrote this book, uh, is that they are intertwined and healing is also intertwined. So if you're more secure, you can experience the grief and if you um, and better, and if you understand where you are financially, it allows you to grieve in the way that you need to grieve. What messages do you both of you have for widows who weren't previously involved in their, their family's finances? Do they immediately call their financial advisor? Do they start going through desk drawers and trying to find out what's what? How do you? Well, our that? book uh, really uh, answers that. Uh, the book answers that question in that uh, we we try to start with the, the basics. You know, here are here are those steps. Certainly, the advisors are important, but again, each widow differs. So they might have an advisor and met with the advisor. In other cases, they didn't work with the advisor. 
uh, and they have to find an advisor, or in some cases, they worked with the advisor with their husband or not, but aren't particularly fond of the advisor. We've all heard cases of people going to the financial advisor and he says, don't worry your pretty little head, when in fact, she really wants to understand. She wants somebody who can help her through the process. So I think the uh, the advisors are key that we go through uh, what the role of the lawyer, who of course is your first person, hopefully you have a will and, and your husband had a will and that's an order, your accountant and, and your financial advisor. And then if you don't have them, this is what to look for. So um, I think the advisors can lead you down the path. But simultaneously, we do go into, you know, look, for, hopefully you have some financial files, what to look for, uh, what steps to take. We try to make it step by step. And again, as Mary alluded to, the more that you feel that you have control over your life. You're you're in a situation where you're out of control. You you could not control when your husband died. So he died. And so now you have to deal with it. The sooner you can feel that you have control, the better are you are better you are and the uh, sooner that you can emotionally heal. Well following following up on sorry that. I don't mean to interrupt. Sorry, keep going. Okay, I was just going to say, following up on that, for, in my situation, for example, um, I felt fortunate that Alex was in place because she knew much, much more about my situation than I did. Um, so I had someone to go to. If you have, a, if you don't have a financial advisor and you have a lawyer, that's another person or another contact that you might start with. But the primary message here is don't stick your head in the sand. Uh, don't duck, as I did when he said, honey, let's, you really need to know. And I would say, no, no, yes, I know you're really right. Another day, I'm doing whatever I was doing. You need as a, a woman, a widow, you need to understand. And if you have that opportunity, you should take it and you should not postpone it for another day. Um, and I think that's a very important for any, any woman. And by the way, we should say that uh, although our book is focused on widows, we've heard from many, many people, widows who've shared it with their daughters or men who have read it or been re has been referred to them to share with their wives. So it has information that it really is beneficial to all women. And the other common myth out there is that because you're, you're a career woman, as Mary was, um, you're involved. But, but that sometimes is actually the reverse is true because the career woman, such as both of us, um, have, have a career. But we also have another career, which is working with our husband, our social life, uh, with our children and possibly our grandchildren, and so in running the household. And if you if you can say to your spouse, and he says, oh, I'll take care of the finances, you say, terrific, honey, one less thing, one thing I don't have to worry about as I'm bouncing all these balls in the air, and, and, and you're relieved. But... But that's, as Mary points out, it's a good excuse, but it's one that you should <laughs> avoid making because you really do need to know at least the basics or at least where to go. And that's why we really urge people to get to know their advisors, whether their husband is working with them or whatever is happening. In Mary's case, she wasn't crazy about the accountant her, her husband had selected. But this is another issue. We suggest you don't run out and replace them right away. Work through them through the settlement of the estate. And then after that, if you're not happy, then you can look for other advisors. But you're pretty much, I won't say stuck, but you're better off working with the current advisors until you've gotten through settling the estate and then you can move on. Unless the situation's egregious, which does happen from time to time, but not often. I agree. I ask yeah. about that because I had a friend who, very wealthy, a lot of money, but her husband left her in a big mess somehow, and she's still not sure how it happened. And she hated the advisor. He would not give her any 
any information. He had always worked with her. He really did not like working with the wife, in quotes. And she beat him down. She wasn't going to tolerate it. But once the estate was settled, guess who got dumped? Well, I hope so. <laughs> oh, yeah. But she <laughs> was smart enough to say, not... yeah, I'll stick with you for right now. She didn't say it out loud, but, you know, in her head, she's, I'll stick right. with you right now. But as soon as I can get rid of you, you are gone. And I will not refer you to my other wealthy friends. And she didn't. Well, of I think that's I mean, a that, statistic. I, um, I'm sorry, Mary, but it is a statistic that a lot of widows leave their advisors. And in our case, not to pat us on the back, that doesn't happen. But it doesn't happen because we really do insist that the widow, the, the wife be part of the program, whether they want to be. I mean, Mary came to the meeting. She may not have paid attention, but she did come to some meetings. So right. at least that you're you're there. And uh, so I think that's important. And I think um, some advisors make the mistake of only dealing with the male and uh, and that's not such a good idea. You definitely don't. I mean, I the reason that I did leave the accountant was he was one of these people who just never really gave me a straight answer on anything. So I said, don't worry, don't worry. You know, I'm taking care of you. You don't have to be worried. You have enough to on your plate. And that is not a good message on many levels. One, you don't know what he's doing, really. Um, and uh, you're feeling stuck that you can't go anyplace else. So you really need to be able to work with somebody that you feel you can talk to and ask a question or not be made to feel as you don't count or, of course, you can't understand this. Uh, and I, I think that is something, a message I would like to give also any any woman. You shouldn't stick with somebody that you really don't feel is right for you. One other thing, by the way, in the initial meetings with whomever you're meeting, we really recommend you bring someone with you to those initial meetings because there's usually follow-up things to do. And you're when you, you're in the initial stages of loss, you're lost. Um, and as you alluded to, you don't necessarily process what you're being told. And if you have somebody with you that can take notes or is in a better position to comprehend what they are being told, you will find that that's helpful as well. So now I am, I'm scooping around through your book. It's a great book, by the way. And I am on chapter 12, Protecting Your Assets. So let's dive into that, if you will. Well, I think that most people just consider insurance. Um, they don't consider they might uh, life insurance, but they uh, we we cover house insurance. We call talk about health insurance. We talk about disability insurance, long term care insurance, which we think is very important. And so it's all aspects of protecting your uh, assets, as we as we say. Uh, for instance, with long-term care insurance, we hope you never need it, but but it's important to have uh, if it, if it applies to you. And the different kinds, we try to explain the, the basics of insurance uh, so that you do protect yourself and your assets. Is this before or after you lose your husband? Or well, should this again, be part of the conversation? It's all in place before and. Uh, that you, you have a nice little file drawer that has all your insurance policies in it and that you know who the agents are and how to contact them. Uh, ideally, you'd have, uh, if, if everything's in order, you have a piece of paper that or something on your computer that says, okay, here's the agent, how to contact them. And obviously, and maybe not so obviously, you have different agents for different things. In most cases, the household insurance and auto insurance are together, but your health insurance might be with somebody else. So you need that list of what. It, so again, one thing we do suggest is, let's say that you're a married, happily married couple or married couple that the beginning of the each year, you have a financial meeting and, and go through this stuff because, you know, when was the last time you read your will? When did you last time? Because things change. There's divorce. There's uh, there's marriage. There are children. There are grandchildren. There are things. So if you just look at these things, like once a year, of course, the beginning of the year is sort of a good time because you're doing your taxes or 
hopefully gathering your stuff together for your taxes that to go through these things together so you know what the information is and you know where it is so that if something happens to either one of you it might be you and it might not be him um that you're prepared well, I think we should talk to, I just want to say that this, right. uh, we considered whether to, it, this was something that we could include widowers, but in going through some of the research that we did, we found that the issues were really very different. Um, and that the thing that usually in contrast to other things, the thing that the widower usually didn't have a clue about was how to run the house. Um, or, you know, did the carpets need to be cleaned? Did we have to keep the housekeeper? Or what are we doing? Or how to make social arrangements? And with the the woman, it wasn't those things. It was more these fundamentals related to how am I going to survive? And how do I move forward? So all, although they're both experiencing loss and might be going through some of the same experiences, what in life they're dealing with, it, it appeared was very different. And the thing with women is the first question they ask is, like, can I afford to stay in my house? And I think one of the first things they say, oh, I should pay off the mortgage. Well, that's not necessarily a good idea. It depends on what your other expenses are, what your interest rate is on your mortgage, et cetera. So it's a, it's, it, whereas a widower usually has a pretty good idea of their financial situation, but the socialization is the issue. So that's why the statistics are so high of remarriage that the widowers want somebody <laughs> in place to take care of all those things like their former wife took care of. Whereas the, with the woman, she wants to be in control of her financial life and then she can decide what she wants to do on a social uh, level. Oh, we want you, everybody to know we thoroughly endorse a man is not a plan uh we don't encourage you to attach to get to deal with what you need to deal with in life uh this is your life and you need to assume the responsibility for it and not as many women do as alex just suggested is look for another man um to take it over um so uh, a man is not a plan keep that i love that and listen i have a lot of friends who are either widowed or divorced or both and i'm finding and this is just my observation i have no data to back this up but i'm finding that most women after about 40 they're like no i'm done thanks i'm going to take care of life myself i mean you can come and visit but i'm not going to let you in the house so are you are you yeah, we have a lot of cases just like me? that that yeah. uh, friends that they maintain separate households uh and and they have a wonderful monogamous relationship with somebody and and but they don't want to remarry they they they're not interested in commingling finances they you know want to keep their social security and yet they have a loving relationship with uh, their spouse, with, with their companion, their friend. It, we're always struggle with what, how you, you, boyfriend doesn't seem to fit, <laughs> but anyway, or significant other. But a lot of them have uh, good relationships with people. It's just they have decided that they don't want to remarry. I think you're right about the over 40, although we don't have the statistics on that. Um, and I haven't seen any, but I, in my own personal experience, I would say if it's a more woman who has led a professional life uh, and is over 40, the likelihood is they're going to feel OK about handling life on their own uh, without having to have uh, a husband. And of course, as we point out at the very beginning of the book, there are many more widows than widowers in the United States. What is it? Three to one, I think. So uh, the pool, there's not as big a pool. <laughs> and so if you, particularly if you had a good marriage, you may, may think, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be that lucky again. So anyway, I think it's, but again, it's a personal thing. Right. The book focuses on widows, but... And I think we might have touched on this a bit earlier, but how can other women benefit from the information you've provided? I'm still on chapter 13, and to me, protecting your assets, to me, that should be chapter one if you're not a widow. If you're taking care of yourself and if you're 
you know, trying to make sure that you're going to be okay, that you're, you know, you're making your mark in the world, but you're not going to die destitute and, you know, have to be cremated and put in Potter's Field, that you're doing okay. But I think protecting your assets should be a first step for a lot of women. Well, I think it's a very important step, but I also, as a financial planner, would say budgeting is very important. One of the things that we emphasize is let's figure out how much things are costing and what your income is. and then. But remember that this is not a permanent thing. This is something that's going to change due to inflation. Unfortunately, we've had a big lesson in inflation recently. And so although your cost of living may say be 50,000 a year now, going forward, it may be 60,000 or 70,000. And so you've got to make sure that you uh, make sure that you have sufficient income for the future as well as not as as well as the current thing. Um, you know, the women, for whatever reason, have this fear of becoming a bag lady in their uh, in their as they grow older. And we do live a lot older. Uh, we live a lot longer. And so it's I think that's important. And, and also investments are important. But the, in terms of uh, understanding the basics of investment, which is a way of protecting your assets, because you make you understand how important protecting against future inflation. And then things happen. You know, your child gets a divorce and you help them out. Your child uh, gets uh, wants to start a business and needs help, uh, which is another thing we bring out in the beginning of the book. Don't be quick to give loans. Uh, make sure that you uh, are, are sure about that because um, it's it's that some people say, oh, mom has a lot of money now that dad dies. Well, mom may need that money. So it's important to protect your assets that way, too. I want to come back to what you said about the, the investments, because you can't focus on investments when you're in the very first stages of mourning, because you really don't know what you're looking at or what you should be looking at or to whom you should be speaking. So you must get, you know, it is a must, you have to get through that very early time period or a time frame in order to focus on some of these other issues, which, as you know, one of the adages that you see and hear in the media and other places is not to make any irrevocable decisions in the first year, whatever you thought you were going to do, move closer to a child, sell the house, whatever. Don't do it for at least a year um, until you see where you're at. But while it's critical to be able to understand your investments and how to protect them. You're not going to be able to do it while you're going in 18 million directions in the very beginning stages of mourning. I am now on chapter eight, and thank you for sharing that. This is an important chapter to me. It's called Calculating Your Net Worth. So let's dive into that because I think we don't know what we don't know. So go. Tell us about that. Well, I think people get scared with calculating your net worth. We probably should have named that chapter something else. But basically, we try to demystify that by saying, well, it's nothing more than saying, figuring out what you own and what you owe, and that's your net worth. And knowing that gives you a better grasp on what the future will bring. So uh, we have a little table in there to help you figure out what your assets are and and uh, what you owe. It may re require some digging, like finding out what is it, how much you currently owe on the mortgage and what is your current rate of interest. You know, a lot of people have at this point, I think I saw a statistic that 70% of current mortgages are at a low interest rate at 3%, which is one reason why the real estate market is a little stagnant because nobody wants to get rid of this good loan. But if you have a good loan, if you may never see that rate of interest again. But you need to sort of, I think that's the first step in determining where you are, is figuring what the assets are. And one of the assets may be your life insurance. And one of the things we warn you about is 
your uh, insurance agent as well-meaning as he or she might be, might say, oh, you really need to convert that to an annuity so you have fixed income. And whereas a, an annuity may be a great idea, it may not be. So you need to, we, we advise people when they first get the life insurance, that one of the options you have is just to keep it in a money market fund with the insurance company. And then at a later date, you can decide what you want to do with that money whether you want to use it to pay for something or if you want part of it to be annuity, but not to brush it into, because once you've done an annuity, you can't undo it, uh, which also brings the issue, as Mary alluded to early, is you don't want to rush into any irrevocable decisions that you can avoid. There's always times to make the decisions you have to make, but anything you can defer, wait till you're less, uh, you're more in control of your life. lost her husband pretty unexpectedly and she did pretty much everything you're taught you're saying not to do she sold her house she moved to where she, her kids were her kids didn't really want that as it turned out she's pretty much now hunting for a, a cheap rental anywhere she's got a list of states that she would like to go to she's lost I mean bless her heart I mean she fell completely apart and I watch her and I listen to her and there's, I don't know that there's anything I can do to help her other than just listen. Well, it's far, she's in the mess she's now created, but certainly if uh, the situation with the children did not work out and she wants to make a move, she should probably try some shorter turn rentals um, and just see how they work out because going cold into, into some, just pick a state, uh, on your own uh, doesn't necessarily work, um, and you certainly shouldn't try to make oh, a no. long-term decision in in terms of where you're going to settle without at least experiencing some life there. And this is a an example Time. of where advisors can help you. Your financial advisor could help you. Your psychologist can help you too, because one of the things we do say is don't chase your children, because so often you moved it. Texas, you know, nobody else except your children. And then they, they either, they get transferred someplace else, or as you you pointed out, um, they're not that interested in having mom that close to them, which which is a hard thing. You need, and particularly at this time, you need friends, you need socialization. So staying in your current environment, at least for the first year is really important because that's where, where then you can decide. But but again, when you're adjusting to being alone after being with somebody, sometimes 50, 60 years, you you forget how important the socialization your friends are, and they become much more important. And it's something you need to take advantage of, which is why we recommend you not jump into something. I feel so sorry for your friend. She should have read her book. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but, but you know, sometimes... <laughs> Right. Because the other thing by the reaction. Way, is it is that it's not a good thing for the relationship with the, the person that you're talking about and the children. So while they may have been getting along fine while mom was living in one place and they were in another state or whatever, having somebody that on your doorstep, so to speak, that you didn't anticipate being there is introducing a new dynamic into the children's um life which definitely may not work it might but it might not um so i i mean we really can't stress enough you shouldn't try to do that um and you and definitely not to make a move in the first year of any sort just try to get yourself <laughs> settled and understand where you are um and, and i don't know how old she is but if i were advising her i would suggest that she uh go someplace where she knows people. In other words, it may be back to where she came from, it may be uh, someplace, but where there's somebody that, that you can talk to, somebody you can have lunch with, somebody you can have dinner, so go to the theater with. You do need that socialization, particularly after you're widowed or divorced for that matter. You know, I mean, I've seen people she's, who have- She's lost. The other side, who have children have brought their parent to them um, which turns out to be a total disaster because the parent has no social life now other than 
um, being with the children. And no matter what the children do, it doesn't work. But the focus of our book is for the women. Um, and for somebody like your friend, it's, right now, I think the only thing you can do there is to be is to listen and damage control if she'll allow you in what she's going to do with regard to moving forward and how to structure it. And, and helping, I mean, I don't know what her situation is, but she certainly ought to have a handle on where she is financially and what the implications of that might be in the future. I'm looking at um, chapter 10, identifying today's personal attitudes and realities. That's a toughie. Yes. It really is. So let's talk about that a bit. We're going to run out of time in about 10 minutes. So just share whatever you've got to share. Okay, well, you, it, it's, it, is, uh, it is a very tough thing. And again, it comes down to uh, what are your personal characteristics as you've gone through life. You know, um, if you've been somebody who like only wants to read or uh, wants to, you know, look everything up online or uh, find out information but not talk to anybody, you're going to go in one direction. Um, if you're somebody who is much more gregarious and has always enjoyed a social life and been involved in activities, then you're going to try and put yourself in a situation where you will be able to have some of those experiences. But you really need to know yourself. And we, we put in there some just little kind of questionnaires to help you figure out sort of where you fall on that continuum because that will also help you decide where and how you want to move forward. 199, it's, it's, you know, one of the little charts. Well, it's not a chart, it's a little box. It's a little. Says, yeah, who am I today personally? What are your personal strengths, your personal weaknesses, and right. your personal needs? I, you know, I'm going to sound like a total ignorant person but I don't think we often explore who we really are I mean we're so busy I mean I will catch myself saying you know I didn't look just as a for instance I never considered myself to be a creative person largely because when I draw a hangman it looks like it needs to go to a chiropractor stat so I was confusing being artistic with being creative turns out I am enormously creative but I didn't know it for the longest kind of time well, yeah, but I mean, see, one of the ways you can find those things out is just make lists for yourself. What are the make a list? What are the things I truly enjoy? What are the things I really don't ever want to have to do? Um, you know, and just try to help yourself figure out, like you just said, well, creativity doesn't mean you have to be an artist. Um, it's it, there are many aspects to creativity. So we we're trying to help these women um, figure out or identify more how they function and what feels good to them and what feels appropriate as opposed to something they don't like at all. Like, I'll give you an example. If you're a corporate wife, and from probably more so years ago, but if you were, and you ended up having to do a lot of entertaining for your husband and you hated it, uh, now is a good time to recognize that um, and put yourself in a different place. So you're not experiencing something you really dislike doing. You know, I, I that brings up a, something that I've experienced personally, uh, which I didn't expect, is widowhood is a very difficult time. But it also gives you freedom. In other right. words, you don't have to put together three meals a day. If you feel like having lunch at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you can. If you feel like having ice cream for your lunch, you can. It's It gives you some freedom to do something to move in a different direction if you so desire you don't have to do the same old same old you did as a widow now i understand i'm a widow with a with a long career so i may feel more independent that way but it's interesting in that there there are that sort of adjustments that some people don't think about that it's not all bad news it can be good news too Because but that takes time. This is not the you in the immediate days and weeks and months after uh, loss. You're not going to be there. <laughs> it might take a few, but you can get there. What I started to say was, you know, after my last relationship failed, 
and I was so glad it did. I'll be honest with you. It was it was time for it to be gone. I felt instead of grief because I had been grieving the two years before we finally finalized everything, but I felt so light. I felt like like you say I can get up at three o'clock in the morning and frequently do because I don't sleep a whole lot. I may be in the kitchen making a gumbo at three in the morning. I may be vacuuming at four thirty in the morning. I'm going to eat what I want when I want. I don't have to negotiate a darn thing. It's very it's freeing. Oh, I will always yes. <laughs> I will never negotiate my life again. No, I mean, so all of the, you know, as we've been talking, uh, there are so many factors that contribute to healing, to moving forward, and certainly an understanding of yourself um, is a very important factor. I, I know that this is an important book, and it's six editions, so it's a very important book. Can you each take a, a few minutes and tell me what was the most important part of writing this book and rewriting this book? for you what has really stuck with you well the message i think for both of us um we are committed to the message that we are sharing which is in neither one of our professions would you find the total answer to what one is experiencing in loss um and that the commitment we know that there are not other books out there that focus on both of these um at the same time and so for both of us, I think, in coming from our individual professions, it was really important to us to provide something to other women to help them at this time in, the, in their lives. And I can add to that in that we wrote, I wrote this book, well, we wrote this book initially uh, quite a while ago, and uh, then what we and I what I did it for a tool to give to my clients so that as I said it went in one ear and the out the other. I said, Mary wanted to read this or Jane wanted to read this and take it a chapter at a time and if you have questions that we could talk it back and forth. So it was selfish on my point. I just was gonna make my job easier. However, what we didn't anticipate was how many people said how it helped them so much. Uh, without it, they didn't know what they would have done, that it was so, and there was really an outpouring. With the first book, we were very fortunate. We sold 25,000 copies, and it was because there was such a need for this type of book uh, to help them. So it's been very satisfying to us that we have created something that actually helps, and it, we still get letters and comments to that effect. So I think it really gives people peace of mind if they go through it and they feel like they're in control uh, or more in control and that they're not alone. A lot of other people have gone through the same thing. They've survived, but maybe our book can help you survive easier or with less angst. So ladies, where can people find your book? Well, of course, Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> On your own, a, woman, a widow's guide to emotional and financial well-being. And just pop it up there and there it'll be. And it's there it'll $20, be. $20. So it's a yeah. bargain. <laughs> I have the paperback in front of me. Is there a Kindle version or will there be a Kindle there version? There is a Kindle version. There is a Kindle oh. version. And we're working on doing an audio, but we haven't we'll gotten to that. Amazon. <laughs> All at oh, I absorb work, you know, books. I, my guests like you will send me one and thank you so much. They become part of my entrepreneurial library. But then I will also, if the Kindle is available, I will go grab the Kindle because I, I like to read both ways. I like to have the book in front of me. I like to have the Kindle. And if I'm listening on Audible, I will often have the physical book in front of me and I'm listening while the book is being read. So I'm absorbing three different ways at least. And I hope a lot of people will do that, particularly with a book that's this important. So again, the book is on Amazon. It's uh, paperback and Kindle. And do you have any last thoughts to share before I reluctantly let you go? Read the book. You will <laughs> gain a great deal of information and it will be helpful. 
And remember, it really could be helpful to any woman. We've had many single women, divorced women, as I say, this was such a help to us. And I learned things that I didn't realize. I mean, there's even a little chapter on uh, rules for investing to make you a little better investor. So there's a lot there. And Mary, I sincerely appreciate your company today. And I hope people will pay attention to what you're sharing and go find the book. They're going to need it at some point, whether you're widowed or going through a divorce, which often can feel the same way. Grab this book. So to our audience, as we conclude today's episode, your feedback means a lot to me. And if you found the show helpful, please support us with a quick review on iTunes. Your input is vital in my mission to inspire and empower more individuals. So don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a review, and your partner in Success Radio with friends and colleagues. And thank you for tuning in. And I will see you next week. Ladies, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.